Okay. Welcome everybody in person uh, and at home. Uh, my name is Erin Andrews. I run programming and development here at Centerville Public Library. And we are so excited that Dr. Joanne Maramoto from uh, the Association to Preserve Cape Cod is here with us today, um, as well as our wonderful friend, Steve, who uh, is a veteran of uh, herring counting. He's gonna share some Centerville specific um, counting details for us. Um, so please sit back, relax, um, take some notes. And again, this is being recorded so we can share it with you um, later today. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Aaron, and uh, thank you all for uh, attending uh, this training session. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about herring and how to count herring. I'm Joanne Muramoto. I'm the Director of Science Programs at the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, based in Dennis. Uh, I'm actually uh, calling in from home. Uh, so um, before we get started, I wanted to say a few words about APCC. APCC was founded in 1968 to preserve, protect, and enhance the natural resources of Cape Cod. As a Cape-wide or environmental organization, we work to promote programs, policies, and laws to protect and enhance the Cape's natural resources and quality of life as well. As a science-based organization, we provide training, outreach, and technical assistance to help communities to protect and restore their natural resources based on sound science. I'm also the regional coordinator for the Massachusetts Bay's National Estuary Partnership. Mass Bay's, as it's known, is one of 28 national estuary programs nationwide that were designated by the US EPA to protect and restore estuaries of national significance, in this case, Cape Cod Bay and Massachusetts Bays. And we have a similar mission at Mass Bays to help coastal communities to protect and restore their coastal ecosystems. So uh, with that, um, today I'm going to talk about why it's important to count river herring and how to do it and how easy it is to do. Um, no, uh, let's see if this works. Yes, okay, thank you, um, works fine. So first of all, I wanna give a shout out to all of our partners and organizations and individuals that we have been working with over the years to promote river herring counts and to conduct river herring counts. Uh, they include hundreds of volunteers throughout the Cape, as well as many hundreds of volunteers off Cape throughout coastal Massachusetts. On Cape, um, all towns except a few um, are supporting volunteer herring counts, uh, Cape Cod Cooperative Extension, uh, the River Herring Warden Network, um, Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, uh, many organizations are conducting volunteer herring counts. Many of these we have helped um, to get their uh, herring count programs underway. And a few had actually been the pioneers in doing herring counts in the mid 2000s, like the Kunameset River Trust and the Three Bays um, uh, Watershed Organization, which is now the Barstable Clean Water, uh, been replaced by the Barstool Clean Water Coalition. Um, I want to mention that the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fishery, Fisheries, or DMF, is a key state agency partner as they created the monitoring method that we use, and they use the count data collected by volunteers and um, turn out run size estimates generated by computer software um, that are then comparable with run size estimates th throughout the state and with other uh, states as well. Uh, the NOAA, Rest NOAA Restoration Center in Gloucester was instrumental in supporting um, our efforts and the efforts of 
Mass Bay is to promote volunteer herring counts throughout Massachusetts. And um, you can see many organizations and groups um, locally on Cape Cod, including the Red Lily Pond Project. Um, I haven't listed individuals here like uh, Dr. Waller, who are um, really key and important for helping us to uh, promote river herring counts using scientific methods. And last of all, uh, donors and APCC members and donors who support this program. So all of these groups and partners are really important, and I just want to give them a shout out and extend our, our thanks to them for helping to make the Capes River Herring Count Program one of the most active ones in the state. So to begin with, uh, uh, what are we monitoring? Uh, we're monitoring river herring. <clears throat> These are two closely related um, species of river herring. Uh, we are not counting the Atlantic herring, which is a purely seagoing or marine um, species of herring. Uh, we're counting alewife and blueback herring. And um, because they're very difficult to tell apart in person, uh, we don't distinguish between them when we do our counts. Uh, in order to really distinguish between them, it's, it's actually necessary to catch them and uh, examine them closely or even dissect them. And since it's still illegal to catch or take or possess herring, um, we don't do that. So we count um, river herring and we include alewife and blueback herring as well. Uh, they can be slightly different in appearance perhaps and on the Cape, it's um, sometimes considered that the alewife may run a little earlier or start their spring migration a little earlier than the blueback herring. It's also said that the alewife tends to prefer to spawn or lay its eggs um, in freshwater ponds, whereas the blueback herring is said to pre prefer spawning or laying its eggs in freshwater streams. But in practice, um, I'm told that they they do a little bit, they each do a little bit of each. Some alewife will spawn in streams and some blueback herring will spawn in ponds. So um, the term anadromous is really, uh, is actually important to understand. Anadromous means that uh, these fish species spend most of their life in the ocean, but they migrate upstream into freshwater streams and ponds in the spring in order to mate, spawn, and lay their eggs. Uh, they then return to the sea um, to spend uh, their life. And unlike salmon, which die after they um, have their spring, their spawning run, um, River herring will survive for say eight years or so, and they'll make this spring spawning migration several times in their lifetime if they survive at sea and they'll make it back. Um, so when the eggs uh, hatch out in our freshwater ponds and streams and the small fry, the young juvenile herring that are born in ponds and streams, spend the summer there feeding on plankton, um, zooplankton, um, sometimes phytoplankton, we're studying that a bit. And during the summer and into the fall, they'll start to migrate out to the sea where they'll grow up and become adults. So during the period when they're growing and feeding in our uh, ponds and streams um, that they're considered, they're called juveniles or fry. Uh, and they're vulnerable to the uh, problems that beset fresh water, such as pollution or warming, um, warming of water, um, algal blooms, and so on and so forth. So um, river herring are, 
being anadromous, uh, experience the problems that may occur at sea, such as climate change, ocean acidification, and uh, they'll also experience the problems that um, occur in our freshwater ponds and streams. And so they're they're seeing the best and the worst of two different, two very completely different worlds. But we, when we count, we're counting them as one. So why do we care about river herring? Um, so this um, simple diagram kind of boils down to a a single word, which is food. <laughs> uh, river herring um, are food or prey for many, many um, different fish and wildlife species. Uh, a lot of these are listed across the bottom. Uh, birds, ospreys, bald eagles, herons, aquatic wading birds, seabirds, otters, raccoons, seals, turtles, other fish. Um, stripers uh, are a well-known um, uh, fish of interest locally, um, trout, bass, you name it. And so here are some of the fish and wildlife species that feed upon herring. And the herring migration in spring, um, these are adult herring that are migrating upstream to spawn, um, is considered one of, an important food source uh, at a time of year when there isn't much uh, food out in nature. Um, the spring uh, herring run is, um, you can often tell when the herring are running by the hordes of seagulls or seabirds that congregate. Uh, I'm familiar with the one in Stony Brook where for a week or so before the main herring run, you can see seagulls lining up on the salt marsh, um, just waiting for the herring to come by. And when the herring are running in mass, then you can really tell because of the um, uh, seagulls that are uh, swooping, diving in to prey upon them. Other runs that are less exposed might not see as much seagull activity. Uh, seals um, uh, are other natural predators. And it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to think of predators as being bad characters, and that's not true at all. They're part of the natural food chain. And one of the reasons that we want to see river herring return um, to their former numbers um, that used to exist in the 19th and early 20th century is that um, they support a huge uh, food web that includes all of these other um, fish and wildlife species. So we don't discriminate against osprey or bald eagles because they eat herring. Um, we simply want to restore herring to the point where we can support, where they can support these other important fish and wildlife species that are important for the ecosystem and also to us. Uh, here are some more uh, examples of fish and wildlife species that eat uh, herring. Uh, so it's e eating herring and I humans, <laughs> we also eat herring, and herring are an important part of our um, coastal culture in Massachusetts uh, and all up and down the Um, they were food for a um, source of income for income for records that's catching herring and the sale of those licenses um, helped to support the local economy. Uh, on the other hand, the massive amounts of harvest, uh, river herring harvest that were carried out 
in the um, colonial times have, have probably contributed to the decline of the river herring. So those are, that's one um, reason why herring are important. Now, um, uh, another reason that uh, river herring uh, populations are of concern is that they've been decreasing. Um, they've been decreasing over decades. Uh, this plot shows um, harvest um, pounds landed of herring going back to 1950 uh, and progressing towards 2004. This is an old graph, but you can see that beginning um, in the early 70s, there was a pretty sharp drop off. But this uh, um, trend towards a decline in river herring actually was started in the early 20th century, um, looking at reports on uh, river herring catch um, compiled by uh, state fisheries agencies and published in 1920. Um, David Belding's report from 1920 um, says that compared to colonial times, uh, the harvest of river herring in terms of barrels of herring had gone down even as of 1920. And so the question uh, that's been floating around among Harry Um, aficionados and herring managers as well. And in the 20th century, uh, fisheries managers have had started to see declines in the um, uh, harvest of river herring. And for many years, the harvest was the only way to get a handle on the population of river herring. So there are many um, causes of decline of uh, river herring, and you can see these on the right-hand side. Um, it's important to keep these in mind because we're still, um, we're trying to address many of these causes. Some of them are very low. Like dams simplified with fish letters. Um, Joanne, you're coming in and out just a little bit. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yep. Okay, all right. I'll move closer to my microphone. So causes of decline, uh, water pollution, habitat loss, uh, poaching, Predation, predation is a um, natural cause. Overfishing is probably the main cause of uh, the decline of river herring, but also climate change. For example, in uh, 2017, uh, there was a statewide drought and a number of large herring runs in the state, including the Mystic River and the Monument River, which is also known as the Borndale Run, and the Herring River in Harwich, um, which are considered some of the largest herring runs in the state, saw a great decline in numbers due to drought. And the way in which drought was thought to have affected um, herring in that year was that um, if water levels are low, then the juvenile herring um, may not have enough water to into streams in order to make it back out to sea and return. Um, and likewise, adult herring may have problems reaching their upstream ponds. Erin, is that better? It is, yeah. It's just the wireless connection is going in and out, but it's great. Okay. Going. Connection. Sorry, let me know no. if you can't hear. So here are some examples of um, Cape Cod herring run sizes over time. Uh, we've been tracking and collecting the count data from different count groups since 2008. And it's part of our role to provide training and assistance and um, 
also assistance with data management um, if groups want it. Uh, and uh, these are the Division of Marine Fisheries using the volunteer accounts from count groups in Cape Cod. So on the uh, left, you see the Mashpee River run and the Marston's Mills River. And on the right, you see run sizes for Long Pond or Parker's River in Yarmouth and Tom Matthews Pond in Yarmouth on the north side. And these plots uh, across the bottom um, are the years. So from 2011 to Sorry, everybody. I 2021, and the vertical axis uh, gives the run server um, going similarly for the Okay, uh, I'll start again. So this is Mills River. You can see that over the years, there's been a sort of a up and down pattern. Some years were high and some years were low. And part of this may be due to biological reasons in that um, the river herring have a, a four-year um, cycle in which uh, the young herring born in one year will migrate out to sea, spend three to four years out at sea, and then return in the fourth year to spawn. It's kind of like um, the returning high school class of uh, one year coming back for a four-year reunion. And so part of the pattern that we may be seeing here is due to that four-year cycle. Um, if we have a low um, spring migration count, then um, chances are four years down the line, um, we may have, you know, the herring born in that low year will come back and their populations had, had not increased in the meantime, so low as well. Um, there are other factors at work and fisheries biologists and scientists are studying herring. Um, to be honest, the state of knowledge about uh, river herring is um, increasing, but before the ban in 2005 and 2006, there was actually f not much known about the herring life cycle out at sea and what affected them. So um, I want to point out these numbers in the Mashpee River and Marston's Mills River um, are kind of stable over time within an up and down pattern, but they have not really increased or recovered back to um, the levels that were that are estimated for the early 20th century. On the right hand side, you see the um, charts for Long Pond or Parker's River in Yarmouth and for Tom Matthews Pond on the north side of Yarmouth. And these are runs that um, for some reason um, started out pretty high in earlier years of the counts, 2016 for Long Pond and uh, I can't read uh, the bottom for Tom Matthews Pond, but they have really dropped in recent years. And it's a source of great concern. Um, Parker's River is going through a tidal restoration project um, that should be um, finished. And the Cape Cod Salties do a great job of making sure that the run is clear and clear of obstacles um, to allow the uh, adult herring to migrate upstream. So it's, it's just not clear what is causing some of these declines uh, with Tom Matthews Pond. Tom Matthews Pond is 
at the upper end of um, Chase Garden Creek um, on Bicycle Harbor. And so it's, a, it's above a salt marsh. Um, again, it's not clear what is uh, causing that uh, decline because that run was restored. The fish ladder was fixed. Uh, so patterns like these are of concern. Um, we do have on our website, I didn't want to show it here, although I do have it on my desktop if uh, people want to see it. We have compiled um, a summary of run sizes for Cape Cod runs where um, counts have been done uh, since 2007, and it's posted on our website. So we have uh, statistics and numbers for oh, 17 to 19 herring runs on Cape Cod where volunteer counts have been done. Is my sound coming through all right? Yep, it's great. Keep it up. OK, great. Thank you. So um, what's being done uh, to address these problems? Well, first of all, there's been a ban on catching herring that's been in effect since late 2005 or early 2006, and that's still in effect. If you go to any herring run, you should see a sign like this, close to the harvest of river herring. Um, out at sea, uh, NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service has also uh, banned um, fishing trawlers, uh, midwater, midwater trawlers from catching herring uh, from Connecticut to the Canadian border. In most of that area, the ban on um, herring is 12 miles wide. East of Cape Cod, where it was determined that there's a, a huge area where river herring congregate, that band for midwater trawlers is wider. It's 20 miles. The catch limits have been set at 80% of the sustainable levels for that, um, for river herring populations. And there are catch limits, actual numerical numbers that um, uh, limit the amount of catch in terms of tons of uh, herring that can be caught um, by midwater trawlers uh, and also bottom trawlers. But um, the weak point is that enforcing these catch limits needs better at sea monitoring of catch, um, which requires funding of observers. So um, funding for better funding for observers and funding for better monitoring systems, um, uh, tracking the positions of vessels, um, automatic methods of monitoring uh, herring catch are needed and all of those things need funding. So that's something to consider when you think about environmental funding that's needed. So another thing that's being done to try to help herring are fish run restoration projects. This is a map of fish run and herring run restoration projects that a APCC's Restoration Coordination Center has compiled. Um, let's see, I see that my internet connection is unstable. Are you still hearing me all right? I am. Okay, good, thank you. So uh, the dots uh, indicate uh, positions of uh, potential fish run restoration projects. There are a number of um, programs on the Cape which are uh, working on funding and uh, carrying out fish run restoration projects. And they include um, programs like the Cape Cod Water Resources Restoration Project, which is a um, 10-year program um, funded um, by Congress uh, with funds that go to the Natural Resources Conservation Service and Conservation District to support local restoration projects for salt marsh, fish runs, and shellfish beds, stormwater projects. And APCC is working actively to partner with and support such programs and individually towns uh, also get support from the 
Division of Marine Fisheries for smaller um, restoration projects. Um, NOAA's Restoration Center also supports uh, restoration projects. Um, Mass Bays um, and APCC provide some uh, funding and or technical support. So um, town natural resource directors um, you know, are keeping up with the needs in their towns. They're well aware of uh, the needs. Some of these have been on the books um, or the need identified for years. And it's often just a matter of getting the funding to carry out the uh, restoration project and the studies that are needed. Uh, here are some examples of successful restoration projects. Um, on the left hand side at the top, uh, you see Upper Shawn Pond and Sandwich, uh, which was uh, before restoration um, for several reasons. Um, Upper Shawn Pond Dam was cut off from the stream and Lower Shawn Pond below it for 30 years uh, because the water supply in the stream had been cut off. And after uh, the collapsing earthen dam had been replaced and the water uh, flow reconnected and a fish ladder installed um, in 2010. Uh, finally, I think in 2012 or 2011, fish were several thousand herring were counted entering Upper Sham Pond. So that was an example of a successful um, fish run restoration project involving a dam rebuild. Um, on the bottom, at the bottom left, you see um, a four foot wide culvert under Route 6A in Stony Brook. This is near the um, uh, um, Dunkin' Donuts uh, in, uh, along Route 6A in uh, Brewster. Um, and um, that culvert, that four foot culvert carried the entire, most of the entire stream flow of Stony Brook um, between the Stony Brook ponds, upper and lower mill pond down to Paynes Creek. Uh, so that severely restricted both stream flow and passage of herring. Um, after the four foot wide culvert was replaced with an 18 foot wide box culvert in 2010, we started to see an increase in herring um, by at least a, a factor of 10. So that the herring run, which before restoration was typically in the tens of thousands, after restoration is now typically into hundreds of thousands. So that restoration um, made a huge difference. And Stony Brook is now one of the biggest runs on the Cape. Um, thanks, we think, uh, to the uh, widening of the culvert. Um, I can tell you when I was monitoring uh, the culvert before um, the restoration and using uh, video monitoring um, you know, we could see that only eight herring could enter the culvert abreast. <laughs> and after the 18 foot culvert was um, installed, you could literally see hundreds or thousands of herring, too many to count, and um, traveling under the culvert uh, together in mass. So it means that they can reach um, their spawning area faster uh, they're less prone to predation and they, they spend less energy um, milling around trying to get through that narrow culvert. And now they can speed upstream. So another really important activity um, are volunteer herring counts. That's what we hope uh, you'll um, participate in and be interested in. Uh, statewide, um, there are about 35 counting sites in Massachusetts. Uh, these include mostly uh, volunteer count programs, but a few electronic counters. Um, on Cape Cod, there are, uh, let's see, there's an electronic counter at um, the Herring River in Harwich, and another one at Stony Brook in Brewster, and across the canal, uh, the Borndale Run, or Monument River also has a 
uh, electronic counter. But otherwise, um, all of the counts on Cape Cod, um, oh, I forgot, may, there may be an electronic counter to Pilgrim Lake Run in Orleans, but otherwise all the uh, counts on the Cape that are being done are done by volunteers, uh, such as yourselves, I hope. So the reasons uh, for needing counts, um, agencies need the counts in order to um, estimate the population and they need population estimates in order to better manage and protect. Um, you, you need good numbers like the, uh, like the census in order to figure out how to manage and protect um, river herring best. Uh, the counts also help to document the success of restoration projects. And in many cases, when they're done, um, uh, on runs which need repairs or restoration, they can help to document the need for a restoration project. We've been uh, working with the Red Lily Pond Project uh, folks to try to help them to uh, do counts um, at Red Lily Pond in order to demonstrate that uh, there are a few herring getting through there. Um, there could be many more. And um, what the counts are showing is that um, there's an obstruction or there are problems in the run that could be fixed. And if they were fixed, you know, we think that that run could be much better. And last of all, um, uh, uh, last but not least, um, doing herring counts gets people outside in the early springtime or late spring, <laughs> depending on when they're herring run, and it helps to build public support for protecting and restoring herring runs. So this is a uh, map of the uh, volunteer herring counts that are being done on Cape Cod. Um, I try to update this year and the circles indicate the um, approximate locations of the count programs. Some of these are counts that are no longer being done. Um, there's a couple like in, as in Bourne, um, I'm not sure that Chatham is going to be doing herring counts this year. Um, otherwise, all of these are active volunteer herring count programs with a few electronic counters, as I mentioned before. Uh, the colors of the circles, um, I've attempted to uh, use the colors to depict what the typical um, estimated herring run size is. And so the red circles indicate the runs with the largest numbers of herring that have been documented using um, counts and DMF um, estimates of run size. So they include um, the Herring River in Harwich, um, Stony Brook and Brewster, uh, let's see, um, the Mashpee River run um, is an important one. Santuit Pond should be uh, large and up there. Um, last year, let's see, I think I added, well, this year, I think I added Steve's numbers, Steve Waller's numbers for the Centerville River, um, which um, were very high. Um, and so we're hoping this year that uh, the numbers again for the Centerville River uh, will be high. So runs that are in dark blue are the smallest runs and the ones that we're quite concerned about and they include um, Long Pond, uh, Tom Matthews, a few others and so forth. Most of the runs on the Cape um, actually are in the range of several tens of thousands, anywhere from 10,000 up to 100,000. And so the majority of runs are in that medium range. Uh, oh, just as a aside, let's see, there are thought to be 40 to 41 active herring runs on the Cape. Uh, that doesn't include um, runs that once upon a time may have been active, but are no longer considered active. 
So getting into the counting method, um, counting herring is uh, very easy. Uh, the first thing is that we follow um, the method developed by the Division of Marine Fisheries, and we encourage all volunteer counting groups to use this method. Um, the reason for using one method um, for all counting groups throughout Massachusetts, by the way, is that the results, uh, the run size estimates are then comparable with each other. The second is that DMF uses the official run size estimates in their um, reports on standing stock of river herring, which are then used um, by the state and also by regional agencies, uh, New, England, New England Fisheries Management Council uh, and others to look at state herring populations and interstate um, or multi-state herring populations. So if the method is not followed, then the numbers, uh, then the population estimates um, uh, can be off. And uh, so we want to emphasize that it's very important. Um, I think it's a requirement for our program that people follow the Division of Marine Fisheries method. And we'll go over that in a minute. It's very easy. Um, the second thing is to count the herring. <laughs> um, that's very easy. You need, you need to be able to see the herring. Um, I've shown a, a photograph here of a herring crossing over the flashboard at the Mashpee River along Route 130, and the herring is traveling from right to left. That is um, crossing the board and going left towards Mashpee Wakebee Pond. And so the method calls for counting herring that cross um, a certain point that you need to decide Typically, it's where um, the fish ladder um, leaves the pond or the pond outlet. Um, once the fish make it into the pond, uh, they've crossed the finish line um, and count for 10 minutes in 10 minutes only. Uh, the third step is to record the information and the critical data are the date when you do the count the start time of the count, 10 minute count, the end time of the 10 minute count, the number of herring, even if it's, if it's zero, um, uh, the optional data this year are the water temperature, the air temperature and the weather code. Uh, we have count forms that we um, can provide and it's on our website. Um, then what do you do with the count data? Uh, you give it to your local count coordinator for your run, or you can enter the data for that run at our APCC website where we have a data entry system. So it's very uh, easy. Uh, let's see, for measuring water temperature, we uh, can provide um, uh, kits. They need to be shared because we can't provide one per individual, but Typically, we'll give a few kits that include a clicker counter and two thermometers. Um, we'll give a, several kits to each group, um, and they can share the equipment. So the details of the method um, uh, are what make for good data. And collecting good data is really important. Um, I, I mentioned before that APCC is a science-based organization. So um, as such, we, we make sure that the methods we used are scientifically based and also that they will be useful. Um, we're not just collecting um, data um, because we like to do it, although that's fun. Uh, we wanna make sure that with all of this effort, volunteer effort, and our efforts that the data are used. And using the method developed by the Division of Marine Fisheries, they can use volunteer counts uh, to generate estimates that are then used by them that they can use and state and federal agencies can use. So 
that's why it's very important to follow their method. Uh, so counts, uh, what's the season for counting? Um, in the past, it's been from April 1st to June 1st. This year, uh, DMF is asking that on Cape Cod, that uh, volunteer groups um, count to June 15th. Um, this is longer, um, this is a couple of weeks longer. Um, and this is based on um, information from uh, past years that indicated that some runs actually, some herring were actually continuing to migrate upstream past June 1st. Can you imagine that? <laughs> um, they, they weren't observing the rules. Um, so this is not, uh, you know, June 15th is probably not going to be the case for every run. So what we say is start to count on April 1st um, and continue counting um, until you don't see any more fish migrating upstream and then wait one week after that. And if you no longer see any fish migrating upstream, then that's the end of that count. Um, likewise, if you start to see herring migrating before April 1st, uh, you can start the count before then, but subject to the next few things that I'm going to talk about, which are how often to sample and how often to do your counts. So, um, in any one day, uh, the counts are done uh, during daylight between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, each count is done for 10 minutes and 10 minutes only, not 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, also, we don't want to see, we, we can't have consecutive counts, uh, one 10 minute count followed by another 10 minute count. Um, you just have to separate it by a few minutes. How often? Now, uh, this, this is where um, uh, it gets, uh, the counting um, gets a little more uh, demanding. Um, ideally, um, at a particular run, there should be nine counts done a day, seven days a week for, for however long you're counting, in this case, 10 weeks to June 15 or less. Um, what that means is that it, it doesn't mean that each individual does nine counts a day. It means that at that run in, in one day, there should be nine counts done by different people. Um, and the preferred schedule for counting is that um, if you divide this 12-hour um, day into three periods, um, one from seven in the morning to 11 in the morning, three counts should be done um, in that period. Whoops, I think I did a, there's a typo here. Do three, I've outlined the preferred method in red. From 11 to three, that's the second period, uh, three counts are done in this period. And from three in the afternoon to seven at night, three counts are needed. So a for a total of nine counts per day. Um, and again, that's not nine counts per person, but that's nine counts per day. And in each of those um, three hour periods, say from seven to 11, uh, those three counts can be done at any time. It doesn't have to be done at the same time each day. It can be done at random times. Um, we usually, we're, we're, we, we have uh, blank schedules that we can uh, provide to count coordinators to sign people up. And when there are a lot of people, that works best. Um, I see, uh, let's see, the less preferred schedule is schedule two. Uh, that is to do two counts in each period for a total of six counts per day. And then the least favorite option, which is schedule three, uh, is to divide, divide the day into two six hour periods and to do two counts in each of those. And that results in four counts per day. Uh, based on experience, I know it's, it works best to ask volunteers to do as much as they can 
um, you know, even if we say you should over the course of the season, you should obtain X counts, let's say 150. We haven't been, that that hasn't really worked. We would get 120. Or if we asked for a minimum of, a, minimum of 120 counts, we might get 100. So we know now that we need to ask for more. Um, and the volunteers uh, will um, rise to the occasion and do more. And um, that will help us to get um, at least six counts per day, or ideally nine counts per day, seven days a week for the whole counting season. Uh, so those are the changes um, that uh, DMF wants this year. They they want they they've been very specific about uh, the timing of counts and. Uh, how it should be distributed throughout the day. Uh, once you do the count, um, you need to record your data on the count form, uh, the date, the start and the end time, uh, the number of herring migrating. Um, again, you re would record any number you get, even if it's a zero, um, and don't cherry pick and don't do consecutive counts. Uh, what do I mean by don't cherry pick? Uh, that means that if the herring are running in mass numbers, um, don't everyone all rush out and do your counts at the same time or at that time of day. Uh, you need to stick to the schedule um, in order to get good data. The objective of this count program is to get good scientific data not the largest amount of fish. And people, we're, we're, we all tend to want to get the highest number, we're, we're competitive, but that's not the objective. The objective is to get good data according to the statistical method. Um, if, and I've seen this, if volunteers rush out and get lots of counts when they see a lot of herring running, that really biases the um, official run size estimate uh, to the point where I've seen um, Division of Marine Fisheries say, well, we can't use those counts because they're so biased that they have tossed the data that were um, kind of clustered or bunched. So I urge you, um, you know, if you're going to be counting herring, follow this method um to ensure that your data are useful and don't deviate from the method and don't cherry pick you know don't rush out when you know herring are running and do your counts and neglect to do your counts at other times when herring are not running it's counterintuitive water temperature um, air temperature, weather, um, this is good. Um, it used to be required. Uh, this year it's optional. Um, and then enter your data onto the count form. And like I say, we have a place on our website to take the data that you've entered onto your paper count form, uh, which you should save up, and then enter it to our website. And at the end of the season, um, give the paper form to your count coordinator who will send it to us or mail your count form uh, to me, uh, whichever is easier and less expensive. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, for more information, um, you can visit our website. We've posted the instructions for counting. Uh, we have the summary of run sizes for herring runs. Uh, we haven't yet put up a schedule of training events um, because we're organizing these even as we speak. Um, we have our data entry system and we have a lot of information at our website, which is this one, um, APCC, our work, science, community science and herring. And then if you want to sign up to count herring, um, contact your local co count coordinator or visit our website. We have a volunteer sign-up form. 
Um, for local counts in your area, I suspect um, Dr. Waller may end up being one of those. Um, the Red Lily Pond Project is also a program that we've been supporting. Uh, the Marsons Mills Herring Count is being run by the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. And um, I thank you. Um, I'll take any questions. Uh, I believe Dr. Waller is next and we'll take questions sometime. Before we get to Steve, we have a couple of questions. Steve himself asked one. Uh, do you know why river herring risk their lives to spawn in fresh water? Is the plankton population for the fry better? Ah, well, uh, that's a really good question. Um, we don't know that they uh, are aware that they're risking their lives to spawn. Um, it turns out that river herring um, born in fresh water that migrate out to sea, come back and spawn in their um, birth waters, as, as you would call it. Um, they're, they're called uh, natal species. That is, they tend to ret return to where they were born. Um, they're homing, in other words. Mm -hmm. And that's one uh, I, I, I haven't really um, answered um, the question directly, um, but Juvenile river herring uh, feed on zooplankton in freshwater. Uh, there, we find uh, we're finding that they're also feeding on cyanobacteria. Uh, that's that's a new um, aspect that we're trying to understand. We found that in the Stony Brook system in Brewster, and also in the Centuit Pond system in in Mashpee. And we're we're trying to understand the implications of that. Um, because cyanobacteria are often toxic. Um, so spawning in fresh water, um, there are fewer, well, maybe there are fewer predators. Um, you know, in ponds and lakes, you, you'll have um, predators feeding on the adult herring, um, bass, um, there's largemouth suckers, um, fishermen, although they're not supposed to be fishing. Um, for the juvenile herring, it might actually be a safer environment to grow up in than in the open ocean. Yeah. Um, but that's something that scientists are trying to understand. Um, there are scientists monitoring juvenile herring populations in ponds on the Cape and off Cape and trying to track them. And sci other scientists tracking and tagging herring at sea to see where they go. And um, yeah, there are tagging studies uh, along the uh, Herring River in Wellfleet and the Kunamesa River in Falmouth to try to understand how herring move upstream. And it turns out that they don't travel in a straight line upstream. They, take, they, they sort of take their time. They go up a little bit, they go back a bit, they go up a little bit. And the reason for that sort of zigzagging movement upstream is, is um, the current thought I'm told is that it gives them time to change their metabolism. While they're out at sea, they're adapted to um, taking in seawater. When they migrate into freshwater and freshwater ponds and lakes, their metabolism has to change to cope with freshwater. So that time that they spend zigzagging upstream, milling around in circles, large schools, may be to allow them time for their bodies to adapt to fresh water. Oh. Um, coming back down, uh, it's a different thing. They'll, they'll probably, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Maybe they take their time on going out to sea. Um, it's okay not to know the answer, <laughs> Dr. Maripoto. So I've maybe answered part of the question and indicated that there's a lot that's not known. Yeah. Um, you, you, brought up, you, you touched on actually um, a further question from another citizen scientist, Jane, who asked if the cyanobacteria is affecting counts at all. Uh, well, it's a good question. We, uh, don't know the answer. Um, in 2019, 
a colleague of ours, uh, Nancy Leland, working with Dr. James Haney from the University of New Hampshire and his grad students and our APCC staff um, found that um, in the Stony Brook uh, system in Lower Mill Pond, uh, juvenile herring um, switched from eating zooplankton, which is their preferred food, um, over to eating cyanobacteria. Um, it wasn't quite clear the reason for switching from zooplankton to cyano feeding on cyanobacteria and phytoplankton may have been uh, that the zooplankton were um, disappearing or being eaten out. Um, looking at the um, tissues, um, the, the juvenile herring had cyanobacteria in their gut. They had um, cyanotoxin in their tissues. Uh, they didn't seem to be affected. In other words, they had a normal body weight and length. Um, so that was published in a paper that um, Nancy Leland and her and colleagues um, published in 2020. I can send that out. Uh, based on that, those results, we expanded a study. We we did a, um, a somewhat larger pilot test study last year to see if we could get similar results again in the Stony Brook system. And this time, we also tested the Santuit Pond system. Santuit Pond has a, I want to say a chronic cyanobacteria bloom problem, has had for years. Um, and um, we were not, we, our sampling of juvenile herring wasn't as successful in the Santuit Pond system. We, we did collect um, enough in the Stony Brook system um, this time we also found cyanotoxins in the stream water from Stony Brook all the way out to Paints Creek Beach. And we found cyanotoxins in the stream water from Santuit Pond um, down to the stream. We weren't able to get um, out to the estuary, but we made it to, oh, I forget the name of that road. Um, Anyway, partway down the stream. So we know that cyanobacteria toxins are, are present in stream water, and they are also present in juvenile herring. And again, it's not quite clear whether the juvenile herring are affected by the cyanobacteria toxin, but we're trying to understand that. Uh, we've run it, we ran into some technical problems, um, that just very difficult to collect enough toxin from these very tiny little <laughs> juvenile herring, which we got a permit from DMF to collect. So, um, but we're concerned because elsewhere in the US and uh, elsewhere we think um, cyanobacteria uh, in lakes uh, have been being transported out to estuaries in San Francisco Bay and also in Florida, where it's thought that they're impacting uh, fish and shellfish in the estuaries. So we're, we're concerned. Uh, the difficulties are technical measuring, you know, but we're, we're definitely thinking about whether that is a problem. Thank you. Um, and yes, they, they do eat the juvenile herring eat cyanobacteria, but their preferred food is supposedly zooplankton. Okay. The adult herring don't eat, supposedly, while they're in the ponds spawning. They, they mate, spawn, do the thing, and then they go up back out to sea as quickly as they can. <laughs> um, and so I don't think, um, you know, we, we haven't really asked the question, uh, are adult river herring eating cyanobacteria? That might be easier. Um, easier answer, but so far we've we've kind of assumed that because it's known or assumed that they don't eat while they're in the ponds, um, that they're not eating the cyanobacteria, but you never know. We have a question from in the library. Hold on one sec. Yes. Um, is there any problem to test the water for 
fertilizers, toxic fertilizers you can use on lawns around here. I mean, some areas like I came from Maine, that, that was uh, prohibited. Mm. So I wonder if there's some sort of restriction on the type of fertilizers we use on residential lawns that are near the near the near the, near the, uh, near the runs. Near the runs. Are yeah. there the question is are there any um, restrictions on uh, lawn fertilizers for for runoff that are near the uh, herring runs near those those bodies of water? Uh, that's a really good point and a really good question. Um, lawn fertilizers are a source of nutrients to ponds and lakes and streams, as well as coastal estuaries. And APCC and the Cape Cod Commission have um, promoted um, and encouraged uh, communities to adopt uh, local regulations to uh, limit um, lawn fertilizers near water bodies. Um, uh, at, at, at least th years ago, there was a state regulation put into place to eliminate um, orthophosphates in detergents. And that has probably helped or helped keep, it, keep things from getting worse. But you've touched on uh, one of the water pollution issues that we think are really um, affecting uh, river herring, both the, the adults and juveniles, and that is excess nutrients. Um, many of the Cape's uh, ponds and lakes are uh, nutrient impacted, um, mesotrophic as we would call it. Our state of the waters project, we try to collect water quality data to grade them based on how eutrophic or nutrient enriched they are. Um, you know, the Cape has nearly a thousand freshwater lakes and ponds, and we're finding that only about a little over a tenth of the Cape's ponds and lakes are actually monitored uh, for water quality. And so that's a big data gap. Uh, so we're attempting to help fill that data gap by monitoring cyanobacteria. We think that cyanobacteria blooms are an indicator of excess um, nutrients, um, as well as climate change. Uh, the major source of nutrients in um, Cape waters, um, Cape wide, is um, nutrients from septic systems uh, that enter groundwater. Most of the Cape's ponds and lakes are connected to groundwater. And if groundwater is high in nutrients, then chances are the ponds and lakes will be high in nutrients as well, and vice versa. There's water exchange between ponds and lakes and groundwater. So think septic systems as the first major source of nutrients to water bodies. That's something that we can do something about. The second thing is runoff uh, from lawns, um, uh, farms, um, gardens, where excess fertilizers run off, and that's um, important. That's something we can do something about. Uh, so it's a very good idea, suggestion to limit lawn fertilizers near water bodies. That's one of the recommendations in our State of the Waters online project. Uh, we have a long action list for towns and organizations and property owners uh, residential owners to do to protect water quality. Um, it's, it's water quality for herring is a really important issue and division of marine fisheries um, recognize that going back to 2010 when they developed a procedure for monitoring ponds and lakes water quality, especially nutrients um, in order to assess the suitability of that pond or lake for river herring. So nutrients are a big problem on the Cape and controlling nutrients, fertilizers, septic systems um, is a top priority uh, for APCC and um, other towns and regional agencies. Thank you. Good, good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maramoto. We're gonna turn it over to Steve Waller. 
Um, I'm going to make sure that I can share with him. Um, Steve has been doing uh, local Centerville uh, herring runs for a little while now, and um, he was just generous enough to come in September to um, tell us about different runs. Um, I'm excited that he's here again today. I'm going to make sure that we can all see him. Um, let's see. And he's going to tell us uh, a little bit about his work. Steve, I hope you have that terrific video too. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Good. Uh, my voice is not very good, so please don't hesitate to interrupt if you can't understand me. As uh, Dr. Miramona said, there are a number of hearing runs on the tape, but in Centerville we have two. Red Lily Ponds, which has an active group of counters, and on the Centerville River, which is where I live. And you may have you may know the Centerville River is actually a ditch that was dug by Civil War veterans in 1867. It's very straight, but not natural. It's about six feet wide and one foot deep. <clears throat> but fortunately, herring do come up every spring. And there hasn't been a count on the Centerville River for years. But the last few years, since my wife and I moved here, we've tried to count the herring. And last year, we had a particularly good year. In fact, we counted nearly 10,000, Jane and I. And the state said that was equivalent to over 200,000 herring coming up out of the ditch. Here's a picture of the ditch from our property. You can see it's very straight, not very deep. And as Dr. Miramola said, the herring <coughs> starts to come up around the 1st of April when the pond water gets to be 51 degrees or higher. And the bluebacks then come a few weeks later. Here's a video of them in the stream. You can see the fish coming up our herring run. And you can also see them, some of them turn back, but you can't count those that turn back. Here's a history of our account last year, and they started on the 1st of April, and you can see they came in schools, in waves. And then after about the 20th of April, things calmed down quite a bit. <clears throat> and by the middle of May, most of them were exiting. Very few were coming up. I also put in the middle of the room there when the full moon was, because I wondered if that might have an impact on their migration. And it does not seem to have been any factor. However, what we did find different than the DMF recommendation was that most of our hearing came between midnight and 7 a.m. So Mr. Shepherd at DMF said, I could count during the dark hours too. But I went out with my flashlight and was counted in, in, at 2 a.m. And the flashlight does sometimes fear them and they turn back. But most of them, particularly air was, went right on up to the run, even in the flashlight beam. So in, in summary, we have two active runs in Centerville. We're both looking for more counters. If you're interested in helping to help this spring, 
please send me an email. We'll probably have a group get together on April the 1st and talk about where the stands, where the, where the rush for the hearing. Fortunately, when they come up to hearing room, they create a bow wave that you can see from 50 yards away. So they don't surprise us. We know they're coming. And one hearing makes it through a bow wave as a hundred hearing. Mm -hmm. We'll show that. And I look forward to sharing some of the world I put to this spring. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'll be sure to include Steve's email um, in the follow-up with a, with a brief survey. Um, on, in September, Steve came with Pat Patricia Dayton, who uh, does work with Red Lily Pond, and she couldn't be here today, but uh, she wants to make sure she is a resource to you as well. So I'll be sure to include her email um, in addition. Um, are there any other questions you have for Steve or for Dr. Muramoto? Yeah. Do you have a counter you use, or you just count it manually? Do you have um, a counter, like a clicker, that you typically use when you're counting, or do you just manually make tick marks or uh, keep? I, I typically count them by threes, just visually. And Jane has a track technique last year. She figured out when they're coming in a big school of 200, to take a video with her iPhone, and then she can watch the video and slow down the frame speed and count them. And That's just for one time, I counted about 200 by my technique, and she used the video, and she got the same number. Oh, so wow. I think most Facebook people, uh, that was just a one time, but we did check each other. Okay, good. Use that technology to, to be helpful for us, videotape. Yeah. Okay. We, we have uh, clicker counters. Uh, these are handheld clicker counters. I don't have one on my desk, uh, but they're tally counters. Every time you see a herring, you click it and you record it. Um, so we can provide free, um, let's see, counting kits that include one clicker counter and two thermometers, uh, one for measuring water temperature and one for measuring air temperature. I can provide a few kits per organization. I think last year I provided eight for the Red Lily Pond project. I can probably do that again this year um, for anyone wanting to count at Centerville uh, River. Um, I can provide a few kits. Um, you. you know, uh, I, 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 I like the idea of video counting, but I want to say that 10 minutes per count is the limit for a count. If the video was running for more than 10 minutes, then, oh. you know, you've got to stop the video and at that no, point. No, it was only um, about two minutes to end. How was the 10 minutes? The very two, long came lunch. Right. So, uh, Two minute count is, um, I hate to be a stickler about this. <laughs> I, I think these videos are really important for, uh, um, for, for uh, 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 raising uh, public support and enthusiasm. I, I think they're incredibly uh, 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 inspiring to watch videos and I encourage you to put them. But I wouldn't use them for counting if they're not for that time period 10 minutes okay. i wouldn't i would not extrapolate from two minutes to 10 but i would encourage you to share the video and post it because those sorts of things are really really um important for inspiring people and showing proving moreover that there are herring Absolutely. you know numbers numbers and numbers but when you have a video you can show people that there are herring, and that's that's going to be important at Relily Pond. Um, but for counting purposes, um, you know, we've we've worked on video counting um, mechanisms with DMF, and they have an official. They use video counters at a few uh, runs um, in Massachusetts. One being the Borndale run, and it's a complicated affair. Um, so you can you can do the exercise of counting off the video, but I don't think it's usable for the count program per se. 
Sure, Jane. Yeah. Thank you. Joanne, if I could just clarify, I didn't run a video for 10 minutes. I just would, uh, if there was a large group of uh, herring coming up, I would capture them for maybe, as Steve said, 10 or 20 seconds on the mm -hmm. video, kind of to train myself, yeah. you know, how yes. to count a big, a big group of fish coming through. Yes. It was more yes. to train my ability to estimate because they were coming through much faster mm -hmm. than you could count with a clicker. So right. I didn't do this for 10 minutes at a time ever. I don't think I ever did it more than, as he said, probably 10 or, or 20 seconds. And it wasn't every time we went out to count. Which right, I understand. Game. No, no, I and the uh, the little clip I showed you of the herring crossing the finish line at the Mashpee River was taken from a video that we took for the very same purpose, just to show that there were actually herring um, right. traveling up and making it over the board. Um, and by golly, they were going fast. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so that's a problem when you've got a big run. Uh, the Mashpee River has had that problem if you will that there are sometimes thousands of fish moving through and at that point you just have to do the best you can um if you want to use the video for a 10 minute count that would be interesting um but uh just doing it for a short period of time and then extrapolating won't work but but i kind of like you know if you if you have that time <laughs> to do a 10 minute video and then count um th that sounds like a good school project um, <laughs> um yeah, every now and then um but but i i i i want to encourage everyone to stick with the dmf procedure the time periods the time of day if you want an exception from that sampling period uh, we'd have to talk to John Shepard at Division of Marine Fisheries, um, you know, about that. Um, but definitely, videos for training are really useful, and I've I've used the Mashpee video for, for the very same thing, training myself to count using the clicker counter every time a fish crosses the video. Sure. <laughs> it's, are it's there any other fun. questions before we close out? Okay, I'll be sure to send information to everybody, uh, contact information, the link to APCC and where you can put in your own data. Um, I just thank you so much for participating today. Uh, Zoom is a fickle uh, friend and I just, uh, I'm grateful that you are patient through our ups and downs and look forward to seeing you all in person, I hope soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Uh, Steve, we appreciate it. Thank you for being here, everybody. Be well. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne.